All right, so there's no shortage of crises today in the world, right? We've got sequester, we've got climate crisis, we've got all these crazy things going on. And yet, if you think about it, it human nature, there's a tendency ultimately to act feminine in times of crisis. And I want to throw that out there and talk about that for a couple minutes in the context of a couple stories. And I'm going to explain it through two things, through investment bankers and canned mackerel. I'll start with canned mackerel. So in Ishinomaki, Japan, there was a guy named Nagato Kimuro, and he had a canned mackerel factory. And he was a victim of the, the tragic events of 311 when the tsunami hit um, Ishinomaki. His entire factory was destroyed. And what happened was all these little cans, these tins, started floating and showing up all up and down the beach. Rescue workers found them. A group of people in Tokyo heard about this, and they decided to travel up and help them out. And they gathered up all the cans, and they brought them back to Tokyo to sell in an effort to try to help rebuild their factory. Now, you're all marketing and branding experts. How do you sell something that doesn't have a label? Right? There were no labels. So what they decided to do was just put the cans on the store shelves bare. Now, keep in mind, this is very raw time in Tokyo. This is a matter of days and weeks after the crisis. And what ended up happening is that people came in and did something remarkable. They started decorating the cans with messages of hope and support and messages like this, which says, help each other, Japan. And Ashino um, Kimura-san talked to me about, in Ashinomaki, how this incredible event just basically catalyzed his company and brought it back to life. In the end of the day, they recovered 800,000 cans, and across Japan, this was known as, as cans of hope. We're seeing a fundamental shift in the role of masculine and feminine values in the 21st century. We live in a world that's increasingly social, it's increasingly interdependent and transparent, and I'd argue that in this world, feminine values are ascendant. And that's because the most innovative among us, men and women, are actually leading by deploying and taking feminine skills, ideas around flexibility, around compassion, around nurturing. I'm saying that they're leading on the basis of the Athena doctrine, which follows the, the advice of the goddess of wisdom whose strength came from her equity and her fairness. And what we're seeing in our data and in our interviews all over the world is that people are deploying feminine strengths and values to make their lives in the world just a little bit better. So Michael D'Antonio and I, my co-author, we basically surveyed 64,000 people in 13 countries across a wide swath of cultural, political, and economic diversity. So we gathered data from everywhere from Canada to Indonesia, from Mexico to Peru, and what we were able to do is sort of take that data along with in-depth interviews where we traveled 150,000 miles to 26 different countries. We talked to people in the favelas of Peru, in the villages in northern India. We actually talked to world political leaders in Brussels and Jerusalem. We talked to NGOs and startups in Africa and in Kenya and in other areas around the world. And what we did is we started to talk to people. We started to get this portrait that this is a really obviously challenging time for many people. So many people believe that life will be better for my children than it is for me. There was 51% of people that disagreed with this across the world in our 13 nation survey. There's too much power in the hands of large corporations. Nearly 86% of people agree with this. They question that their countries care about them. 76% disagree with that statement. And then that the idea that the world is becoming more fair, nearly 74% of people disagreeing with this. And when we look at this, what we see sort of underneath is sort of this idea of this global referendum on men. So a question, I'm dissatisfied with the conduct of men in my country. The majority of people around the world are dissatisfied, including nearly 80% of people in Japan and in South Korea, and two-thirds of people in the United States, Indonesia, and Mexico. Now, it, what's interesting is that Canadian men must be doing something right, <laughs> but they're really the anomaly in our data. Um, and what we started to see also, quite interestingly, is what's happening with millennials. Millennials, young men and women, have a fundamentally different appreciation and role of respect for women in their society. So in highly masculine countries, three quarters of millennials you know, are dissatisfied with the conduct of men in places like Japan and in South Korea. And in fact, there's a double-digit generational gap between millennials and men over 50 in places like China, Germany, and South Korea. Now, what's driving this is these codes of conduct and, and behavior that have led to reckless risk-taking and scandal. 
And we asked this question, would the world be a better place if men thought more like women? Nearly two-thirds of people believe that to be the case. Again, nearly 76% of people in Brazil and in Germany, all around the world sort of people are questioning these codes of male conduct and behavior, codes of control and aggression and black and white thinking that have led to many of the problems we face today, from wars and income inequality to reckless risk-taking and scandal. And so we got really interested in these questions, and we started to sort of step back and say, well, you know, how could the world be a better place if men thought more like women? This was sort of a, a technical problem for me because I'm not a woman. And, and to get at this question, I needed something, you know, much more profound. So Michael, my co-author, and I, we are dads in all female households, but that kind of hardly qualifies as empirical research. So what we decided to do was conduct sort of two separate studies. So we took our 64,000 people around the world and we divided them in half. And in the first group, we asked 32,000 people around the world to basically classify 125 different human traits as either masculine or feminine or neither. Okay? Now in the second half of the sample across the world, we asked people to take those very same traits, those 125 traits, but we asked them to actually connect them without any gendering at all to how do we solve today's problems. What are the most important things we need in terms of leadership, success, morality, and happiness? The various things that people see are in crisis today. So then by statistically modeling the two samples, we could actually start to understand what is most important to solving problems. So overall, what we saw was a lot of consistency around what people around the world feel to be masculine and feminine, and this idea that the ascension of feminine traits and values are becoming increasingly important. So let's briefly look at a couple examples. The first thing that we saw and we were surprised to see is how the essence of the modern leader today is feminine. So people are looking for more expressive leaders, right? People that really put their hearts out there and really connect on a more emotional level. This was highly correlated to modern leadership in the eyes of people around the world. We're also really looking for people to be sort of flexible. The idea is to, you know, think about today, you know, everything we're dealing with in the United States with um, all the structural issues that are happening in terms of the politics in D.C., People want more flexibility. They want more consensus building and more compromise to get things done. It was also really interesting to us to see how important planning for the future, this idea of long-term thinking, sort of you know, distance, distancing ourselves from this idea around sort of compromise and really, or sort of expediency and really thinking about long-term things. So you know, decisiveness, resiliency was still really important, and these were seen as a bit more masculine. But look, how, look at how they were also val balanced by flexibility and by loyalty. And this idea of aggression and pride and independence, these things farly trailed in terms of sort of connection to leadership when we were actually looking for more empathy, for more passion, for more patience, and for more selflessness. So we started to see this portrait emerge of sort of a tone-deaf leadership. And if you're too masculine, you're not really connecting to the ordinary needs of people around the world. And we started to see these same sort of patterns happening. We saw it with morality, where you would have expected to see a lot of differences based on custom and culture, and yet the same patterns emerged. And then the highest correlations to feminine values connected around the world of happiness. So, you know, in this context, what we started to try to understand and see was that there was this building portrait around how important things were today around driving happiness. So in a world with less money, happiness is a more important measure of success. Nearly 80% of people believe that. Other sort of questions around, you know, culture and values and kindness and empathy. The rise of kindness and empathy as a mandate for both marketing and corporations has become increasingly apparent in our data. So what I want to do is just talk to you a little bit about some of the leaders that we met when we traveled around the world. And the first guy we, we met in Berlin, his name is Dr. Ayad Madish. He's got a PhD in virology. He was at Harvard. He's just a brilliant guy. And as I met him and I talked to him, he kept saying, you know, John, I kept getting stuck in my experiments. And when I went to my colleagues for help, they basically said, you know, why are you admitting you don't know something? You know, and he started to understand just how precious it is to publish your own work and get up there and be the smartest person in the room. So what he started to do is he said, you know what, maybe my vulnerability can reshape science. So he went off and he started ResearchGate the first social network for scientists. He's been in business for three years. He now has two million members around the world from 200 different countries that are doing some really interesting collaborative work. His goal is to crowdsource a Nobel Prize. Vulnerability. 
I met Major Orna Barbavai. She's the highest ranking woman in the Israeli Defense Force. When I asked her how she approached military strategy, she said as a mother. She said, you know, it's important to assess multiple points of view and to really carefully consider the consequences of your actions before you partake in aggression. She also talked about how women at checkpoints can actually de-escalate conflict. And to that end, two of her daughters manned checkpoints at the Syrian Gaza Strip. Also spent time with Leo Risky at the Felicis. Have you heard of this? The Felicis is Danish for house for everyone. This is the first shared embassy in the world, home to the five Nordic nations of Denmark, Norway, Iceland, Sweden, and Finland. This 21st century model of diplomacy is about putting aside cultural differences and working together for the betterment of all. I couldn't help as I noticed as I spoke to Leo outside that directly across the street was the Syrian embassy that was shuttered and covered in graffiti. So we started to see all over the world this happening, and, and what I'd like to leave you with is sort of two quick thoughts. One is the inclusion of feminine values is absolutely vital to GDP and growth. We see it through our data matched against economic development. The more balanced you are as a, com as a country, the more you're including feminine traits and values, the more prosperous you will be as a nation. But secondly, the other important point here is that both men and women can participate in this because in the inclusion of feminine values, you have greater quality of life, greater economic development and greater quality of life. So this is less about men versus women in a zero-sum game. It's about men and women coming together and understanding that feminine values are an unlocked source of strategic advantage for the 21st century. This is the opportunity we have today to solve our problems and to sort of leave our, lead ourselves into a better life. And I'll leave you with Eriko Yamaguchi. She was a young woman who was bullied so badly that she had to leave school. She actually took up kickboxing, and she, one day she went on to Yahoo, and she looked at what is the poorest country in, in Asia and discovered it was Bangladesh. She had a fashion degree, and so she went and leased a factory in Dhaka. There the workers were basically making sacks for grains and potatoes. Over two years, she taught them how to make high-quality handcrafted handbags. She gave them badges for their esteem. They'd never had these. And today she now has seven stores throughout Tokyo, and her workers are paid double the average of any other workforce in Bangladesh. So this is the power of thinking like an Athena. And I guess what I leave you with my last thought, I really believe that today feminine values are the operating system of the 21st century, and that women and men who can think like them are going to create a world that we're all going to want to inhabit. Thank you very much.